Give the gift of liberty this holiday season by becoming a Cato sponsor on behalf of a friend or loved one. Visit Cato.org slash podcast sponsor. And if you support our work with a thousand dollars or more, I'll give you or your designee a shout out on the podcast. Help us advance the values of individual liberty, limited government, free markets, and peace by becoming a Cato podcast sponsor. That website again is Cato.org slash podcast sponsor. And thank you. This is the Cato Daily Podcast for Monday, December 30th, 2019. I'm Caleb Brown. Being more honest about the costs, benefits, and incentives built into the cash bail system is an important first step to reforming it. Josh Crawford directs the Pegasus Institute in Kentucky. We spoke in Colorado Springs about bail reform in October. You know, of the discussions I've had with uh, friends who are attorneys, who are judges, who uh, follow these issues regularly, especially when it comes to bail, it has never really made a lot of sense to me that um, your ability to generate whatever your bond is bears any relationship to the risk you pose uh, to society. Yeah. So it stems from this idea that you as the defendant should have some skin in the game and you should be uh, accountable to the system to return. For folks who are first-time offenders who have significant ties to the community, the idea is they should have no bond. They don't need that additional assurance. They don't need that additional incentive to show up. And the system works okay when that's the case, where you look at the offense committed, you look at the criminal record, and you look at the history of whether or not they showed up for court, and then a judge determines some amount generally an amount that the individual can afford that gives them that skin in the game. The problem is, is that the system hasn't exactly worked that way over the course of American history or the 15 centuries that we've been using some form of surety bond in Western civilization. And so for those instances where, where you're trying to give someone skin in the game, it makes sense. The problem is, is that bail has evolved to include uh, questions of public safety, and questions of uh, detention because no amount of money could reasonably assure that Aaron Hernandez, let's say, is going to show up for his trial. And so in those instances, money has been sort of a square peg in a round hole. They've tried to take the existing system and adapt it to other needs of the criminal justice system. So uh, what's the fix then? Because there, you know, there's an enormous cost if you're we know, at least as a judicial t determination, that being detained pre-trial is not punitive, mm -hmm. even though it clearly is. Right. And uh, for people who are, you know, for a given offense, three days in jail means losing your job. Mm -hmm. It means uh, your children may not be properly cared for. Mm -hmm. uh, it may mean that you lose access to like the the revenue from working that allows you to continue to pay rent i mean it it clearly is extremely costly so uh, how ought we to think about uh what ought to be the standard mm -hmm. for saying oh you're just going to stay in jail yeah the the solution as is so often is the case is to inject this wonderful constitutional concept which is due process and to just be more honest about what we're talking about i'm comfortable with the idea that there are certain individuals based on the offense they've committed based on the evidence about their having been the individual who committed that offense and based on their criminal history who need to be detained pre-trial i'm comfortable with that um, for public safety reasons or because they won't show up to court but if we're going to do that then we need to be honest about that and have an adversarial process by which a prosecutor presents evidence, typically to sort of a clear and convincing evidence type standard that says, uh, Joe defendant uh, did these things. Here's the, the, the proof I have that he did these things. And it is the, the Commonwealth's belief or the, the people's belief or the state's belief that uh, absent this person being detained pretrial, they will not return or they are a significant risk to public safety. That's not how in most states it works right now, though. If a judge feels that an individual is such a risk, uh, either to flight or public safety, they simply impose a bond that they know that that person can afford. Now, are there knowledge problems where a judge may not know what an individual can afford. Sure, and we should fix those too. Individualizing um, 
uh, assessments for what individuals can afford to pay is a, is an integral part of this process to say, if you, Caleb, and I, Josh, have committed the same offense, similar criminal backgrounds, but you work for a prestigious think tank and have you know, all the money that is associated with that kind of job. You may be overestimating the <laughs> extent to which that is true, but go ahead. Um, and I make minimum wage. Uh, it would, at, at the surface, seem fair for us to have similar bonds. But in reality, $1,000 for you means you post that $1,000 and get out. And $1,000 for me in that minimum wage job means I stay in jail until I plead guilty or or my case is otherwise disposed of. It seems like that kind of uh, case, uh, that kind of uh, system where you're trying to make a determination about what somebody can afford falls apart if you are if not predominantly, at least largely, dealing with people who are engaged in criminal enterprises. Yeah, I think there's there's a fair bit of truth in that. Um, and and for a lot of people, that number is going to be zero or close to zero. And and that's when it comes down to a judge to say, okay, if my goal here is to, to give someone that skin in the game because I need them to come back, and this assessment says that they can afford $200 or $75 or $50, then I have to trust that that assessment is correct. And there've been jurisdictions in particular in New York City that have moved to this kind of model. And in, when the judges have faith in it, it works well. And when it doesn't, it doesn't work well. Uh, but what it's highlighted among other things is that for a lot of these folks, there really isn't a need for a financial bail. For some people there are. For For your offenders that are more serious than that class of people, but don't rise to the level of people who uh, I think can be detained pretrial and and can be constitutionally and justifiably, there may be a need for some sort of bond. But again, we have just overemphasized for hundreds of years now the use of money in our pretrial system. Another issue related to bail, and this is particularly uh, pernicious in Kentucky where you live. it uh, is, is the idea that people who are awaiting trial, uh, who have been detained either through an inability to pay bond or just been ordered to, to be detained, are crowding, mm-hmm. uh, are overcrowding jails. Yeah. So Kentucky, the Kentucky jail system system-wide on aggregate right now is at 123% of design capacity. The average Kentucky jail is at 148% of design capacity. That's significant because the the 148 is above and the 123 is fastly approaching. The percentage of overcrowding that the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation was at when the United States Supreme Court said, you have to get below a certain number, and that number was 137.5%. And so on average, we're already above that. On aggregate, we're just below it and we're slated in 10 years to to hit that. And so the pretrial population contributes significantly to that. And then in a way that is sort of uniquely Kentucky, um, we have about half of our felony convicted population that should be in a state prison pushed down into our county jails because... What does that do to the incentive at the for the county jails? Yeah, so there there are four counties right now who currently uh, are sort of revenue positive because of this system and uh, by housing uh, federal inmates as well. There are a number of counties that are trying to get to that place that want to get more and more of their pretrial population and their misdemeanors out and some of these sort of state inmates in because it comes with a $31 a day per diem. The problem is, though, is that $31 is just $31. Um, if that inmate has health care costs that come later, there's not more money that follows it. Um, and, and as you sort of indicated from a financial standpoint, this is also not a particularly healthy population that we're dealing with when you talk about those potential costs down the line. And so most jails will tell you that it costs about $50 a day to actually run the jail on sort of a, a per inmate basis. And so that $31 a day is this sort of little carrot that's out here, but it doesn't actually, in most circumstances, result in positive revenue. It's a really bad business model. Okay. How many, how many states have that problem? That kind of uh, the, the state inmates down in the, in the county jails problem. So it's us in Louisiana that have about 50% of our um, state inmates in county jails. Uh, I tell people all the time, love Louisiana, love New Orleans. I'll be there in a, in a couple of weeks. But Louisiana is never the state you want to be in the same sentence 
in especially when it comes to criminal justice questions. I mean, most of the Supreme Court cases that are sort of seminal in terms of of uh, defendants' rights come from Louisiana cases, and so it's not a, a place that you want to be. There are a number of other states that have about twenty percent of their felon inmate population in county jails, but the average is about three percent. Most states have about 3% of their convicted felons in county jails. In Kentucky, it's about 49%. So uh, at what point, and you can tell me whether or not this is true, uh, there are felons, uh, people who have been convicted of felonies who have no business using a state or federal prison bed. In Kentucky? Anywhere? Anywhere. So absolutely. I I think you have to have a conversation about... Uh, penal code reform uh, as a part of this and prioritizing what um, should and shouldn't be criminal, certainly what should and shouldn't be a felony. Um, That's a conversation that's going on right now in Kentucky as it relates to certain drug possession charges. We felonize drug possession across the board. Um, The interesting thing for us, and a lot of states actually experience this though, is that we have this bifurcated system where the state prosecutes felonies, counties prosecute misdemeanors. Uh, The state theoretically houses convicted felons. The county uh, houses convicted misdemeanors. And so the resources to do things like drug courts and and to get folks in a drug treatment are much greater in that state system than they are in that county system. And so if if I waved a magic wand right now and defelonize drug possession, I would actually probably decrease access to things like treatment for those that population. And so there's sort of a, a more comprehensive fix that's needed there, but it's absolutely needed. Josh Crawford runs the Pegasus Institute in Kentucky. We spoke in Colorado Springs. Please consider becoming a Cato podcast sponsor. Visit cato.org slash podcast sponsor to make a gift before the end of the year. And thank you 